Good morning, hello, and welcome to another episode of Securities Lending Live with PurePoint. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Uh, look, we're we're back, uh, and I can see a bunch of people have already signed on. So that's the value of doing it every week. Uh, say hello if you've uh, if you've signed on. Um, but the idea of these uh, these events is to discuss relevant topics and themes and give really everyone in the audience a, a chance to uh, participate, ask questions, make some, just, some suggestions. We've had some great uh, narrative commentary as well from guests in recent weeks, so I really encourage you to do that. Um, th there, there aren't really many forums where you have an opportunity just to uh, explore issues, ask your questions, and get them answered by uh, people with a degree of uh, expertise. So feel free to ask a burning question. Practically, what happens is uh, I'm the host and I'm also the producer, although I get paid the same for some reason. Uh, so if I'm not looking at you directly, it's because I'm looking to my right, which is where some of my data and uh, and question tracking uh, is uh, is coming through. Or if I'm looking slightly to the right, it might be at the uh, it might be at the script. It might be at the uh, beautiful uh, panelists that we have for you today. Uh, and if I'm looking to the left, that's probably because that's where I'm keeping a couple of the presentations that um, uh, that, that I'm going to show you today. Uh, just some slides and some data that that I, I think is quite interesting. Uh, and if I look anywhere else, that's probably because I have an. Ex extraordinarily short attention span. So um, uh, remember, there's a delay in you putting the comments in uh, and the uh, time it actually shows up on my screen. So, uh, so just uh, bear with us. Um, so first of all, the question I have for you is, as we start every show, where are you watching from? So just type it into the box. So I will now ask my panelists to uh, introduce themselves. Uh, first, John. Morning, everybody. Uh, John Arneson. I'm the consultancy lead for PeerPoint. Uh, having spent, prior to that, most of my career running, managing agency lending businesses. Thanks, John. Uh, Julian, uh, our collaboration uh, partner and special guest. Um Morning, Roy. Morning, all. Um, I'm sitting in North Kent, looking forward to our digital conversations in due course. Thanks very much. And now our super special, extra special guest, uh, David, over to you. Thanks, Roy. Uh, yeah, so hi, I'm David Schoen. I look to the digital agenda here at ISLA. I've done since June. Um, prior to that, I've spent my time between State Street, UBS, and Barclays across a number of different products. Thanks very much, David. And uh, so now let's get started. So we're going to talk today um, about at least three things. I say at least because, of course, uh, if there's any sort of critical issues that you want to raise, pop them into the uh, into the chat, and we'll uh, we'll see if we have an opportunity. And I have to say a special hello to uh, Jean Pierre <laughs> Provo, who is my. Uh, my colleague at the depository in Canada in the early '80s, and uh, and my roommate for uh, for a period during that time. He's here from Canada, where it's uh, four Five minutes past. Four. Yeah, so uh, so well done, and uh, and welcome, JP. Great to see you. Um, look, we're going to start with, uh, as I said, three things. We're going to talk about uh, the U.S. House of Representatives session on GameStop Part Three. Uh, we're going to look at uh, how Korea has fared over the first week of the reintroduction of the short selling. And then in the second half of the program, we're really going to concentrate on the uh, uh, common domain model. So uh, PAC session, um, and uh, uh, and I'm looking forward to it. So let's start with the U.S. sessions. So Thursday was the latest of three sessions that they've had. Um, uh, the witnesses this time were Gary Gensler. He's the newly appointed SEC chairman. Uh, it was Michael Bonson, who's the president and CEO of DTCC, and uh, Roger Cook, who is the president and CEO of FINRA, which is the uh, the, the regulatory entity um, of uh, looking at broker dealers in the U.S. Um, so that was the session, uh, as you probably expect from a group of officials. Uh, there was nothing that sort of was earth-shattering or earth-changing, no big announcements. Um, but 
there's no question that Gensler made it very clear that uh, potential guidelines for increased transparency and disclosure for short selling and securities lending very much on uh, the SEC agenda. Um, so uh, uh, that's potentially going to have an impact uh, on the business. Um, the interesting thing is, unlike this session where it was, you know, people that were, you know, responsible positions, regulatory uh, or clearing agencies, uh, they were saying, look, we need to investigate, we need to ask questions, as opposed to the previous ones where often it was a case of, we're okay, it's those nasty securities lenders that need looking at. Uh, so, John, with that uh, little bit of an introduction, I'm going to first say hello to Alina from New Zealand who's joined us again, uh, winning the prize two weeks in a row for furthest away viewer. Uh, John, over to you. Yeah, so let me get, put some little bit more flesh on that. Um, the first thing I would uh, would, would, would um, comment on is the fact that this session was over four hours long. And because it's done on over Zoom, you can watch it on YouTube, and I suggest, look, I don't suggest you watch all four hours of it because you may lose the will to live. But because it was done that way, as opposed to over TV in Congress, you kind of felt that you were part of the audience because you're watching a Zoom type call. And if you ever thought that your Zoom calls went are going badly and there are technical issues or there are stop, stops and starts, you're in good company with members of Congress. Um, as Roy said, there was a number of um, you know, representatives from various associations or, or, um, or, or uh, supervisory roles. Um, it started off with a number of congressmen, and most of them were Republicans, um, kind of having a bit of a dig at the current administration um, in, in terms of they were talking in glowing terms about the, de, um, democrat, the democrat, de, democratization of markets and how uh, finance has been uh, revolutionized by the tech industry and how it's, it's developed tools that are available to everybody and that the current administration is trying to stifle that or suppress it by rolling out old policies that aren't appropriate, which I was quite surprised by. I actually thought it would be more that the Republicans were defensive of the way it used to be. So that was a kind of surprising to me. And, they, and there was a particular, um, Pat McHenry um, um, was quite vocal about that. And his argument is that all investors should have equal and um, uh, equal opportunity to invest and uh, he made he made a reference to um, the gig economy and not being compensated um, by equity which apparently the current administration has rejected as a policy um, then he went on to something interesting um, working with zero commission um, isn't um, always the whole concept of zero commissions is a, is a belief that the investor is actually not paying for it. But I thought it was quite interesting that there was a subcommittee uh, member, uh, Brad Sherman from California, who said, no, actually, what you're doing is you're paying for it in the bid and offer spread. So don't think that it's zero commission because you're paying for it somewhere. Sherman was quite an interesting character, actually. He went on, as Roy mentioned, to talk about short selling disclosures and, and the need for that to improve somewhat because it is... And Roy, I don't know if you if you can concur this, but he said that the uh, submissions are quarterly, which I didn't think was the case. Actually, <laughs> I think that's a miss. He misspoke that. But either way, he was saying that short selling um, disclosures need to improve, and I'll come back on to later as to the way he said that uh, it's actually inappropriate the way they're disclosed at the moment. Uh, then we had a Democratic um, member of Congress, Bill uh, Hersinger, who got really quite irritated in the same vein in that he said look the tech is fantastic we can go into we can now trade fractional shares with zero commission again there's much more interest to the market and they should this should be allowed to flourish but it's the democratic administration that is trying to vilify this and suppress it now uh, gary gensler who roy mentioned is the new chairman of the sec he's only been in the role for three weeks and he did make reference to that quite a lot because I think he's saying, let me get my, let me find out where the loo is first before I start getting into the thick of it. But he, uh, he was, he's a very thoughtful and analytical guy. And he kind of talks about the intersection between tech and the markets, which is forming the symbiotic relationship. But he went on to say that look, new tech is not new. I mean, every time something develops, the market react to it and it, and it shows up in either speed of execution or in a number of other ways. So his question was, 
uh, kind of it to himself is that how does the SEC go about achieving its goals in terms of public policy? And he reminded the audience that th there's three tenets to the SEC. One is investor protection. The second is promoting fair capital markets. And the third is to facilitate capital formation. Now, he said that the, he went on to say that the apps that have been created that allow retail investors to trade securities um, is a very good thing. He was absolutely supportive of that. And I did notice that when asked later about um, the use of the likes of, say, Robin Hood, to use them as an example, he said he, it is not his job to, uh, to in any way, shape, or form, um, restrict the free speech and, of, of individuals to be able to trade in the market. So if we ever thought there was going to be some retail regulatory approach, it's not going to come from the SEC. Um, so that's the point. So re regarding the ability to, to invest and to trade, he said people are encouraged to do so, which he does think is a good thing. But he caveated that with certain academic studies have shown that, the, that frequent trading actually produces lower returns over time. So are these apps and these companies actually encouraging frequent trading? And therefore, is that in the best interest of the individual? Because part of the SEC's mandate is to always think about protecting retirement assets, which kind of is a slightly controversial subject because now he's saying he needs to protect retail investors from spending their retirement funds. Um, they went on to talk about order flow. Uh, does it create conflicts of interest? Um, and in particular, an inability to, to create best execution. And there's another conversation about a real concern the SEC has about wholesale markets in general and market makers as there tends to be a concentration of these and he doesn't think that's a good thing because history shows us that it hampers innovation and, and competition when there are you know few two providers um, performing these functions so that's that's in their wheelhouse at the moment they're thinking about that um, short here they talk about short selling as Roy mentioned I think it's fair to say that uh, and Gensler mentioned that he has, he's looking at short selling under Dodd-Frank from 2010 and what it was supposed to do in terms of greater disclosure. But he also lumped that in with um, securities lending in general and the functions of uh, total term risk swaps. And he said that he's asked his staff to, his words were, to start thinking about how they might address this. Now, you can read into that what you like, but it seems to me that all the things that we thought have gone relatively quiet since late January uh, are actually being discussed and there will be policy at some point in the future coming out of this. But but they will be very thoughtful about this because policy will turn into regulation and therefore they'll take their time to assume to, to capture everything they want to do so. Um, the DTC talk, Bob, uh, Bob uh, what, was it? what was his name, Bonson, was it uh, Roy, I think? from the DTC talked about how margins work at work there and how at the end of January, trading volumes went to like 470 million transactions. So therefore, obviously, the margins had to increase. Um, his, his real take on this was that, look, the best thing they can do to lower margin and to lower risk is to move to a T plus one environment, uh, which they are absolutely uh, going to do at some point. But he didn't want to he didn't want to shy away from the fact this is a huge undertaking both for the DTC and for and for its its members. Um, in fact, there was a senator, there was a congresswoman from Missouri that said, "Why can't we go to real time settlement?" And his answer to that was, "It's impossible to do so. You have to pre fund every single transaction. The market isn't set up to do that." Now, of course, somebody eventually is going to say, "Well, if you tokenized it and you had a." central bank digital currency, you probably could do that, but this wasn't for uh, for last Thursday. Um, they asked about whether Citadel should be regulated from a market risk point of view. Um, and and Gensler was, he kind of avoided the question to some extent. He said, that, look, we're only here to, to really regulate a concentration risk to some extent, but he did go on to point out that, look, there is concentration risk in other areas of of markets. For example, he used the example of Google. He didn't name them, but he was referring to Google and Amazon absolutely clearly have concentration risk, but they seem to operate 
um, and, and they're not being regulated out of it. Um, rather than me talking anymore, I'll just mention something I found quite amusing. Um, uh, Bob Sherman from California then asked about cryptocurrencies and, the, and Gensler pointed out that the SEC has nothing to do with regulating cryptocurrencies. And um, Sherman said, well, that's a good thing because they're only used by terrorists and tax evaders, and we are going to put a stop to it. So good luck with that, Mr. Sherman. Um, we'll see where that uh, leads to. So in conclusion, I'll say that behind the scenes, there is going to be new regulation coming out to address some of the activity from January. It won't be to vilify retail investors, but it will be to look at how that how the effects of that did lead to something of a disorderly market for a period of time and whether they need to change the way that they regulate some of the component functions that went into that. But I don't expect it to be a vilification of short selling or in fact, uh, set lending or anything else. But I think it will be more about, do we need to make disclosures more frequent and more available to all? Uh, John, that's a, that is a tremendous, uh, tremendous summary. Uh, so well done. Uh, I've listened to it twice. Uh, and I would concur that listening to it once is uh, is a bit of an ask for people. Um, look, you, you touch on so many different things. Let me let me just add some perspective uh, or some additional comments on that. On payment for order flow, uh, there is uh, every session they talk about the fact that the UK and Canada have both uh, banned. Um, uh, have banned that practice, right? And you know, for many years, it, it's not been possible. Uh, I'm not certain what that actually says, other than one market has one rule and another market has a different rule. So, I, you know, to me, that's that's interesting, and it'd be useful to see whether there's any academic evidence of of the impact and the reach of retail investors, because of course we know that in the UK, retail investor participation in markets is nothing like it is in the US. Maybe the fact that payment for order flow and this this appearance of zero commissions is one of the reasons why. <clears throat> the other thing is the zero commissions uh, payment for order flow uh, aren't necessarily interchangeable, right? Payment so Robinhood in theory can make a profit uh, from uh, from payment for order flow without having to actually impact the bid offer spread. Bid offer spread is is done at the market maker level, so they, they aren't. It's not mutually exclusive. The, you know, it isn't one or the other. The, again, that's another facile comment made by uh, politicians who are so far beyond their uh, level of competence. It's it's stunning. <clears throat> the the comments on market making, I think, are really interesting because uh, absolutely, you know, Citadel quite proudly boasts. There are over 40% market share retail order flow. Um, but of course, what the regulators have to recognize, the politicians that made the laws and the regulators that implement them, are that they have created the conditions that meant that uh, the market makers of old no longer can be profitable the way they're doing it. And so now we have these market makers of convenience. So the, the market makers that are providing uh, uh, activity today or support to the markets today are there when they're there and they're not there when they don't want to be there or when the models don't work. But that's also a construct of politicians and regulators and they can't just step away from that. Yeah, um, and, I, and I think I think Gensler totally got that point right, that um, he seems like he really is quite uh, switched on to these issues. And I think there will be some statement or policy coming out of that. I don't know how you, you make someone make markets, but I think you can relax perhaps some of the restrictions or the barriers to entries that have made expensive. Look, I've spent, I've spent uh, many years at banks uh, and it's at times been uh, very opportune for what I've been trying to do is to get, it would be to get the bank to become a market maker uh, in a market. And I will tell you since 2008, there is zero chance of getting anyone to do it. Right. And that's, uh, and that's a self-created, uh, market liquidity impacting uh, um, result of, of perhaps unintended consequences, but consequences nonetheless. It was discussed at Davos three years in a row. One year, uh, the uh, bankers were dismissed. The second year after we had the Chinese uh, sort of uh, mini crash in, in kind of January, and Davos followed not long after that, the bank said, see, we told you. 
uh, when markets start to fall, if there's no banks doing prop trading in the way, they gap down pretty large and pretty fast because no buyers until someone thinks it's really super cheap, which means it has to gap down. So there was some feeling uh, that there was going to be progress on that. Uh, but then they stepped away from it again the following year when it was raised again. They went, no, that was last year's problem. So look, I think that's a, that's a fundamental issue. Um, uh, T plus zero uh, with the current infrastructure is a pipe dream, as as the guy said. Um, T plus one is hard enough. If you think about the fact that about 30, 40% of, of order flow for the U.S. is uh, from non-residents and foreign exchange is still T plus two, how do you actually marry that up? So good luck with that. Um, I, I, I think it's something we need to work for because he is right that there is, is risk reduction. But I, I think it's really interesting when they talk about sort of the accumulation of risk at the end of January. Um, and yeah, obviously record volumes, and we saw that with the Options Clearing Corp and their their own statements about uh, about volumes. But um, that's, they set record levels in in the first quarter, so I think that's indicative of that. But you know, I, I think all of us probably have worked at places where there have been a VAR calculations, and when you get to the end, if you're doing like a ten year VAR calculation. And you know the calendar moves on, <clears throat> and you go from the period where uh, Lehman was included to Lehman wasn't included, and all of a sudden you get all this extra capital uh, um, that you can trade with against counterparties just because the baseline changed. Nothing's changed as far as the risk profile, but all of a sudden you can trade more. So you have to be careful with models. And those people doing sort of three monthly uh, volatility models, uh, now January, the end of January, peak and trough and volatility is gone. So, so some people is freed up again. So you have to be careful with all this stuff. I was really super concerned in the immediate aftermath of, of GameStop that uh, there would be regulatory, um, uh, a hammer come down. I, I then did a, a private um, session with uh, speaking session alongside someone from DTC and someone from the SEC. Feel much, much more comfortable that exactly what Gensler is talking about is, is what the, the plan is. Sober, sensible, intelligent investigation, and we'll see what kind of proposals come out of that. So, so I feel better better than I did. On that note, Roy, just just so something I didn't mention that there was a guy from Finra there, Bob Cook, um, who made who said that you know the effects of late January they has made them rethink the effects of tech, and um, and they're looking into whether any broker dealers um, broke compliance regulation. They said they sent out a lot of notices, which I think reg notices seem to be. You are <laughs> reminding you that you are subject to this regulation, but he did conclude that they're going to be a much more. There is going to be a much more formal investigation, so they are going to dig around and they are going to come up with something. They're going to, they're going to come to their own findings as to whether anybody uh, behaved uh, nefariously. Yeah, but look, I, I, and we'll we'll move on to Korea after this. My my only closing two closing points. One is, as you said, this is a political bashing as much as anything else. One side against the other. So, so, and I think that that happens, but I was surprised at the first one. It's carried on both times since then. Um, the other point is, I think it's stunning that so many people are focusing on the gamification of apps for Robinhood and not really looking at the fact that how was how were any of these newer dealers able to be able to take on so much business that they couldn't cope with the collateral requirements at a peak period. That's what the focus should be on, in my opinion, right? The rest of it is all sort of spin. So, uh, again, people in the audience, uh, feel free to agree, disagree. Uh, we'll move on to Korea in a second. First, let me say hello to uh, two other long distance. It's just today is yeah. long distance day. We have uh, Kartik from India. Hopefully, you're still with us because you uh, signed on a few minutes ago. Uh, and David from uh, Australia again this week. Thanks uh, for joining us, David. So uh, that is um, that is the U.S. Uh, I'm sure we'll revisit that many times uh, uh, again. Now let's uh, now maybe let's look at South Korea. So I'm going to switch in a second, but. Uh, I got some stats from um, uh, my friend Sam Pearson at IHS Market, who said that since 
Korea has uh, opened up again. The um, amount on loan has reached $12.7 billion. Now that's up from nine and a half billion at the end of April, so a pretty quick ramp up. But even today, uh, uh, with that 12.7 billion, we're not that far off from where it was at the end of um, at the end of April, where uh, sorry at the start of 2020 before the short selling ban, where it was 13.4 billion. So start of January 2020, 13.4 billion. Today, twelve point seven billion. But I'm just going to switch and show you some things on this slide in a second. So I will now share screens. Hopefully, I'll share this right screen. Okay. Um, a quick thing. Hopefully, you can see all of that. Um, so that's what's happened to Korea. So the red line, obviously, is where the short selling ban was reintroduced at the start of uh, start of May. So you can see the market is up, but we've had a couple of down days. Um, I gave you some stats from IHS Market. This is uh, from our friends at DataLend, who are showing the uh, lendable value, uh, which has risen pretty dramatically. Uh, some people weren't lending their assets, even though the restriction was on short selling, not securities lending. Obviously, that's come back into the market either at a client level or a, uh, a vendor level. So supply is going up. Uh, the loan value uh, going up. You can see it's gone up pretty dramatically. So borrowing started in anticipation of the run-up. And guess what, folks? The same old stocks that were shorted before the short selling ban are pretty much still the same targets as they are today. Quick look at the fees. Um, securities lending, supply and demand game. The more demand there is for a security, uh, the higher the fee. We see that very clearly here. As the markets ramp back up, we see the fee level going up. So uh, thanks to Data Lend for that. Uh, Sorry, Roy, just, just to clarify something here. So is that fee accumulation of fees generated or is it a weighted average fee overall? Uh, Look at the left-hand column. That's basis points. So that's, well, um, okay. that's so. So you've got higher volume. On as soon as the bands lifted, we get higher volume um, and higher fees. Yep, people are trading. So uh, and borrowing, and now there's back to competition. Now let me look at um, a good old uh, friend of mine uh, that has actually made me money at my last firm quite a lot for our clients, and that is Celtrion. Uh, everyone's favorite South Korean stock to short. Um, this is what's happened to Celtrion since the short selling ban. Uh, I don't know if you can see that, but it's kind of up, but it's it's definitely moving down. Interesting stat out of last week. Uh, foreigners were net sellers of Korean equities. Institutional investors in Korea were big buyers of it. And um, retail investors who have dominated over the last year uh, they were net buyers, but not as much as institutional investors. So you have domestic Koreans coming back. You have foreigners selling. So that's not only divesting of long positions, but also short selling activity. But the reason I've blocked this off is because you can bet that if Celtrion drops again below the uh, the level it was at at the reintroduction of short selling, that you get another bash against short sellers. So I just want to leave you with this last slide here, which shows you what Celtrion's been doing uh, before the short selling ban was uh, was lifted. It's on a downhill trajectory. So if anyone tells you that short sellers are the ones that are driving the price down, uh, they would be uh, they would be mistaken. So. Let's leave it at that. Um, so we'll just, so John, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, but I, I'd like to move on. Uh, no, no, I think, no, I mean, I, you covered it. I mean, it, it's it's just more ammunition. Next time we have the, the the whole debate around whether you should ban short selling or not, roll out some slides and, and show them. I don't, but we've done this so many times in the past. I, I fear that, that no regulator will ever listen. Roy, did, did the South Korean authorities publish the benefits that they perceived from the short selling ban? Uh, no. So, so, so this is what I think I've raised this before. My, my issue with short selling bans, uh, I, have many, I have many, but the main one is that there is plenty of academic evidence that shows that short selling bans 
have a negative impact on markets. So there's been lots. Lots came out after 2008. Some of it existed before that. Uh, I've only seen one item that tangentially says that once a market has fallen, short sellers don't add any information value to markets. Okay, there's a surprise. But but what what is completely absent, and I'm more than happy for someone to send through to me, is evidence that says short selling bans make uh, markets better and demonstrate how they make them better. So um, the answer is the that was a long answer to a, a short question. The answer is well, no. It's also mentioning uh, worth mentioning Wirecard and the role of a shorting in the industry as a leading indicator of people's analysis of the dangers of Wirecard that the regulator missed. They then defended the short sellers or the, the, the longs um, by banning short selling and were wrong. And investigated the uh, whistleblowers on Wirecard, the FT journalists, uh, the uh, people from Zatara, now Viceroy and, uh, and another firm. So so they attacked the people calling out Wirecard rather than inquire into Wirecard. And frankly, that is why the German uh, prosecutors in Frankfurt are now pursuing Baffin for uh, their failure to protect investors and exercise their responsibilities. And I wholly applaud them for that. Uh, before I hand over to our next topic, I'll also say to another long distance visitor, uh, Eric from uh, Hong Kong. So uh, thanks very much for joining us, Eric, and appreciate that. Um, so we are now going to turn over to the common domain model. I will uh, be quiet now after asking Julian to give us a little bit of an introduction in, and sort of uh, bring us up to date as to where we are before before I move to, Ju uh, to David. Julian, over to you. Roy, gentlemen, thank you very much. Um, there were one or two things I just thought I would mention before we launch into the details of the common domain model activities that David will kindly share us. Um, I think that you know, the working from home and the environment that we've seen over the past 12 months has given some banks, financial institutions, time to consider the service models, the client needs, um, and the suitability of some of their platforms in the current um, emerging digital agenda in terms of new platforms, new technologies, etc. I think a theme that is coming out is an increasing appetite to look at uh, demising legacy platforms. Not necessarily wholesale, i.e. a global find and replace of all of the, the legacy platforms in bank is not really a a fair and reasonable strategy, but certainly looking at uh, modular replacement um, of some of the solutions that they have where there are new, better, cheaper, uh, more efficient platforms available. Um, the consequence really has been an increasing number of new market participants who are providing cloud-based uh, modular software as a service solutions which can be um, embraced, employed, and adopted by the banks on a modular basis. This really also starts to drive uh, an increasing review or consideration of community-based platforms where there are data attributes and there are certain aspects that are enabling users of a community platform to start to benefit from other inputs. So this seems to show that there's a bit of a philosophy change, um, that the market is starting to look at different ways that these emerging technologies can create value. There's a couple of more angles in this. Um, we know that CSDR is about 10 months away, and there are some community platforms that are collaborating, looking um, at organizations like Access Fintech, with uh, netting service, collaboration with SIX, and with other infrastructure providers who play a role in the transaction lifecycle that will be impacted by CSDR. Um, in the reg tech domain as well, uh, the SFTR uh, post go live analysis, uh, there's been some publications from, I think it was ESMA and the BIS, 
around the data quality that has been created from SFTR transaction reporting. And just like EMEA, uh, the outcome is that it's actually not all that good. So again, there's a number of drivers for continued transformation to support and enable uh, regulatory requirements and this idea of collaborative data and information. Another angle that is starting to uh, increasingly play a role is open source. Um, FinOS, for those people that are not familiar with FinOS, I highly recommend having a look at that. Um, the idea of open source applications more than just operating systems is becoming increasingly prevalent and proliferating. Um, it's an increasing maturity question. Uh, low cost of entry for open source technology uh, that is also then aligned with the investment some of the big banks and other contributors have made to the development of open source technology means that open source is becoming increasingly interesting for consideration as the industry looks at demising modular bits of the legacy landscape um, and also seeks to add efficiency and reduce cost of some of the legacy platforms. Uh, a comment I've got on open source is that the business needs to really start to review it. Um, open source is a technology story, commonly uh, has sat in the technology domain, um, and it is in the hands of the IT innovators in bank who are looking at the use cases for open source and how it can be deployed to solve business problems. The business needs to embrace, engage, and start to review this on a much more proactive basis. In the context of open source, um, ISDA's common domain model um, is continuing to evolve. And we note that there was some uh, an interesting news item this week where ISLA has published news that some of the code that was developed during the ISLA CDM pilots in 2020 has now been added to this common domain model code base. Um, this shows really that there was a, a very good successful story around looking at a more standardized approach to uh, data and process, that the usability of some of these emerging open source technologies goes cross asset or cross product. So derivatives plus uh, stock borrow loan and repo. Really in that context, I think it would be better for us to hear um, directly from David around um, what ISLA have been doing and what they see coming next from a common domain model perspective. So David, nice to see you. Um, nice to see you, always a pleasure. Interested to hear a little bit more about uh, your perspectives. Um, so I hope to see a little bit for you. Sure, uh, yeah, so thanks, you've, uh, you've already uh, carried out the uh, small plug for the uh, merge yesterday, uh, but I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Um, so it's been a, a busy first half of the year, um, well, f f first five months actually, as we progress towards um, what we set out as our goal for the year, which was to um, develop enough code to create a minimum viable product um, for a securities lending transaction within the CDM. So just background for perhaps uh, audience that are um, not familiar, just or, or just a recap, um, we carried out a pilot last year um, in which we looked at um, building out the sort of product and transactional definition for a um, cash collateralized DVP loan. Uh, and we modeled the settlement execution and allocation events. Um, and I think we had quite a successful showcase at the end of the year in which a number of the software vendors in our industry um, demonstrated how, how they can use CDM to um, operate between themselves in a way that I, I certainly haven't seen in our industry to date. Um, to get the product to a point where people can actually pick it up and start using it to model system uh, model trades within their system, obviously you need a little bit more than just the initiation of a trade. So for our minimum viable product um, objectives this year, we were looking to tackle reallocations, returns, billing, uh, and non-cash collateral. So that's progressing very well. We're on target um, to complete that um, in, in June. Um, it's been it's been interesting because while um, the pilot did um, show that we uh, came across certain areas 
that were already developed within the ISDA model, just needed a, a few minor enhancements to sort of uh, reuse the components and then make them useful for securities lending, such as the allocation event. Um, this time, because we're more into the, the meat, I guess, um, we've increasingly seen that. So we have um, uh, had to enhance certain parts of the settlement model uh, to deal with um, returns, make sure that we can model uh, you know, transaction versus settlement date positions uh, correctly in the way that our market would want to um, see them. Uh, but equally, um, there are differences, um, as you know, between the legal setup on the derivative side with regards to collateral and the legal setup um, on, on the securities lending side. So there will be enhancements that we're going to make to the model, which are more fundamental and will benefit the, the wider CDM community at the point that we recontribute those changes back. Um, and really, all of this is possible because because of the reusable nature of the, the model. ISDA have obviously put you know three, four solid hard years into this, uh, which helped us get off the ground quickly. Uh, but also the, the agile nature of the um, development process that we've got with our partners at Regnosis. Um, I think it's the first time in my career that I've seen an agile process actually be agile. Um, and I think that just comes from being a trade association um, uh, of our size. We, we are able to bring experts together with, um, with the technical experts and, and just get things developed without the kind of bureaucracy that you might see within um, some of the, some of the, larger commercial firms um so we're yeah we're seeing that um agile reprioritization working quite well at the minute and um, we had intended if there was time to look at uh maybe a bit more on the evergreen side for instance uh, but now we want to make sure that we actually get the non-cash collateral model totally bottomed out so you truly can call it a, a minimum viable product uh, as you said so looking slightly more strategically um, yeah, yesterday we um, announced the merge of the pilot code that we did last year into the, the, the core kind of publicly available CDM. Um, so that's the first time a non-derivative product um, has been put in there and that's the first time another trade association has contributed to the model. And as you rightly said, it's the first step towards um, making the, the common domain model a truly open source community project. Um, so the other strand of work this year that in the first five months has really been ourselves, um, ISDA and ICMA coming together much more uh, on a more regular basis to align our roadmaps around the product, work out where we can um, feed into each other's working groups, either technically or from a business, um, perspective to draw out differences as well as similarities um, and actually it was a combined effort with ISDA to get the merge to occur um, and it shows that we can work together for a, for the common good of our members our members really um, uh, so as the year progresses we want to move we want to move further towards that model we have to come up uh, well we are coming up with a uh, governance structure. Finos is very much likely to be involved. Um, it makes sense to have a third party, independent party, uh, where the CDM uh, sits. Um, and the, the associations need to provide that um, business review and, and gateway that you mentioned, right? Give our members the opportunity to actually review what's being contributed um, by both members and non-members. Essentially, anybody will be able to contribute to that community's uh, project, but you need the um, you need the control and governance that can only be provided by, um, you know, our, our association's membership and the best practices that we represent. So very much in the, in the, I'm hoping by the end of this year, we will have that, um, ha have the majority of that governance structure set up and we can enter into next year with a, a much more um, open source based uh, CDM model in which it's not the is the CDM anymore on the ISLA CDM, it's one CDM across all three associations. I'm going to pause there because I'm sure you've got a million questions you want to ask me off the back of that. 
Look, that was uh, that was great, David. I'm I'm exhausted. Um, uh, first, first, before I hand it over to people that actually know what they're talking about, uh, I'm going to say hello to uh, Imran, who's uh, who's watching us from Pakistan. So, thanks for joining us, Imran. Uh, Julian gave the introduction. John, do you want to, anything you want to add or or ask, David? Yeah. Um, so, David, if I was a very rare creature in that, I, let's say I'm an agent lender with spare IT capacity that, are, yeah. that I'm, and I'm completely sold to the dark side of the force in terms of I want to embrace CDM in all of its aspects. Where do I, what would I, where would I go now to start my work? Or do I have to wait for this, this sort of governing body or this governing control function? I think you mentioned, I can't remember who you mentioned. Do I have to wait for them to guide me? No, I mean, the, the sensible place to go would be to come to our working groups at the moment and pull your resource with the rest of the uh, industry. Um, there's nothing to stop you registering um, uh, with Rosetta and the online uh, portal today, um, although all you will see of the securities lending piece at the minute um, is the pilot code that we merged. Um, and you can pick that up and um, start using it and, and playing with it. You then just have to um, submit. So you will have to submit a contribution to um, the ISDA Architectural Review Committee, which is effectively um, the governance structure that we will hopefully uh, right. okay. evolve into a, a, a true three um, trade association uh, model. I mean, in some, in many respects, it already is in that we are represented. ICMA are represented. And, and increasingly more of our members are actually in that um, forum. Um, indeed, we're actually seeing a lot more joining up internally within our member firms um, where um, we actually have the various people working on, the, you know, from repo, from tech lending and from derivatives actually talking to each other and involving each other in these working groups. So that those firms are actually lined up as a whole um, for, the, for the CDM. Okay, gotcha. That's interesting. Because it, it, it strikes me. Oh, go God, sorry. No, go ahead, you know, I'm done. So, so I, I was saying, David, I, I think it's um, a very good outcome that I was certainly supportive of uh, a little while ago, where the, the industry avoids uh, a divergence of perspectives. How do you manage competing pressures within these combined working groups? to make sure that you end up developing the right piece of functionality that the industry needs. Uh, do you mean competing between uh, products or do you mean even just within securities lending? Well, I guess it's both. Okay. Um, so at the moment, um, in terms of between products, uh, we haven't really encountered a huge amount of um, competing priorities. Uh, and that's primarily down to the way that obviously each association is is funding um, their contributions. Now, obviously, things then have to come together, but in in general, those contributions are not in conflict with each other at the moment. Um, as that community expands, um, you're right. We're going to have to do some. Um, we're going to have to come up with almost a. I don't want to use the word prioritization queue because I don't want to suggest that anything's more important than. Um, anything else from a contribution perspective. But we need to be able to actually um, have a technical way in which we compare, say, two contributions that have been given to us at the same time to ensure that um, if those contributions are both loaded to the CDM, they don't either break each other or they um, cause a regression problem um, elsewhere. One of the primary ways that we're going to be able to do that at the minute, um, now that we've added the securities lending code to the core CDM, so say somebody wants to add something, um, and we and, and as a um, organisation we just want to make sure that it hasn't broken anything that we've put in there, is there are um, there are there are uh, mapping schemas out there now that are public. Um, certainly, one of our software members. Um, has a schema that's public within the CDM, and that will effectively become the de facto regression standard. So I see it less about competing priorities and more about managing um, potentially conflicting bits of code. Does that make sense? Yes, and I, it's a good answer. Uh, and the final question I've got 
is in terms of adoption, how do you see the members uh, actually taking elements of the CDM uh, functionality and moving it into production use? What processes and conversations have you heard from the industry around that? Yeah, this is, um, is a good question. Um, so let, and let's start with, first of all, do our members seem to even want to do it? And the answer is, uh, I would say yes. So in the, um, in the pilot, we had 10 to 15 firms join up to take part. That's now at 30 firms, um, including uh, new members such as HQLAX, so the you know we we've got um, for, for one of a better word the the um, uh, incumbent agent lenders, the large uh, borrowers, but we now also have the 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 new blood um, and the the new tech firms coming through and actually wanting to take part in this. So that that the fact that that group has doubled um, to me gave a sign that a the showcase was successful and b that people want to do this. We've already had, um, I think, four meetings with large players in our industry and their wider technology and business groups within securities lending to talk through the overall strategy of where we're going. Um, and I know at least two of those are, as you said, looking already at kind of strategic replacement um, programs um, over the next few years to replace elements of their systems um and they want to get cdm embedded into those strategies so again a lot of my work in the second half this year is going to be ensuring that i work with those members to um, align and um, ensure that our strategy is aligned with theirs and that actually they do start putting the cdm into their budget interesting we had one member who had started their journey on replacing a system and they got to the point where they said well do you know what we don't want to build a new system any further if it's going to be overtaken by this standard we'd rather come and actually contribute to the standard and then make sure that what we're building is is in line with where the industry is going um the next point i would make is again we have software members uh software vendor members who are have openly stated that they're starting to look at um projects on how they either build natively or adapt their existing systems to start um, messaging with the CDM. So I'm hoping towards the end of this year we'll have a few, you know, a few more slightly public announcements that um, uh, vendors are actually looking to produce software um, using the CDM. Because I think whilst it's whilst one of the benefits of the CDM is that firms should be able to pick it up off the shelf. Um, from the open source community and, and build their own system, um, there'll always be uh, there's always going to be an advantage to a technology, a pure technology firm uh, doing that and selling it to the investment firms than it would be for an investment firm to build their own. Uh, in my opinion, so I think the most likely route is that you'll see vendors adopt it, build new efficient standardized systems, and then selling it to the investment firms. Yeah, I agree. And I think that that is the right model. Um, the investment can be done on a vendor basis, and then that cost investment can be uh, recouped over time. Yeah. Um, and the other acknowledgement is that clearly this is the start of a, a long term uh, rewiring of your grade one listed house. Uh, and therefore, the, the challenges need to be done incrementally um, and carefully. And with that in mind, I think that this bodes very well for the industry over the forthcoming months and years. Agreed. Roy, I think you're on mute. Yeah, I can't hear you. Still on mute. Um, so, I, John, as you said, the House of Representatives all had issues with that. I've been doing this for over a year. I'm still having issues with it. I did a, an Ask Me Anything session on... Uh, on YouTube on Saturday at one o'clock, which I do every week. This week I actually did two because the first one that I did for three minutes, I was talking with the uh, the sound off. So the that's the downside. The upside is most of those people stayed for the second session where the sound was on. And the real bonus there is I got extra stuff for the blooper reel, which will be uh, released at some point. So that's now uh, twice I've done that, but 
you know, it's all, it's all, we, we learn or we succeed one or the other. Um, listen, I, thanks for all of that. I think that was really useful. Appreciate you doing that, uh, David for us. And we'll ask you back again, uh, in the future. Well, well, I, just, I, I just want to share something with you. I was talking to a hedge fund manager on uh, Monday or Tuesday. Oh, I guess today's Wednesday. So it must've been Monday. And he was telling me that uh, about his 17 years in the business. I thought, well, that's quite a long time. 17 years is, is, you know, a good old run. And then I was thinking that, but that's only 2004. That's like, that's like still this century. So um, it started me thinking about, um, about sort of time and what we've seen and experienced. And I just want to, I just want to share something with you. Hopefully I can get the uh, screen share to work uh, properly. Uh, just give me a second here. Um, for those of you in the audience, if you like what you hear from us, um, please give us a, a like uh, or a follow or a thumbs up, depending on which, uh, which platform you're actually on. And I am going to try and share my screen now and just have a look at this in a second. Isn't that great? That's not what I'm trying to show you, but I will hopefully show you this. So in terms of time, consider that securities finance people that have been in the business one year uh, have, they, they joined after the market bottom in 2020. People that have actually been in the business um, for a number of years, repo traders have only ever experienced negative re uh, interest rates. So a, a whole community of people have only traded uh, their instruments in a negative interest rate environment. And John pointed that out to me yesterday. If you have eight years of experience, you miss the European debt crisis. If you've been in the business a dozen years, you still missed Lehman you still miss cash reinvestment problems. You still miss several lawsuits and private settlements. If you've been in the business 20 years, 20 years, two decades, you also miss the dot-com bubble and the Asian financial crisis and the Malaysian short selling ban. If you've been in the business 25 years, you weren't there when Barings Bank was, was rescued uh, or the losses that resulted from cash reinvestment into inverse floaters or the first challenge from investors against their agents about cash reinvestment uh, errors in their view. And if you've been in the business 35 years, you probably don't know that when assets used to be loaned out, uh, they, the accrued interest wasn't collateralized. And that created a condition where a firm was able to borrow security, short them in the market, sell them for the principal plus the accrued interest, take positions, go large, and of course, when they went bust two weeks before their investment thesis turned right, uh, it caused uh, what at that time was quite a quite a large loss. It was one bank uh, alone that lost three hundred million dollars in 1982. Um, so look, that's that's the that's the backdrop. And the reason I've pointed out all of those things is each of those has had an influence on where the business is today. So, uh, given that backdrop. Uh, like I just want to do a quick plug for how people can solve problems. Well, of course, there's training, and we do lots of it. So do other people. You can ask questions of people that you work with. But of course, if you're not in the same office, so you're working from home, or uh, or you're in a hybrid setup, that's harder to do. And frankly, with outsourcing, right sizing, downsizing, and uh, and processizing, if that's a word. Of, of securities finance as it's become a big scale business. It's hard to find people with experience, uh, especially as people have retired or there's been delayering that's got rid of uh, expensive layers. Um, and uh, virtual events like this are great, uh, but not all of them that used to be free are still free. And of course, hosts and sponsors drive the agenda and experts themselves are uh, hard to access and expensive. Uh, so we came up with a pack where there's tutorials. So you can see a list of tutorials that we have planned or ones that we've actually done. So taxation, pledge collateral, long short strategies from a portfolio manager. And this month it'll be ETFs. Uh, we have a daily forum where there's news items, questions from members, answers from members, and answers from experts and tutorial leaders. We have all kinds of exclusive editorial content. 
uh, so the interviews with Legend series really goes to people that were there at the beginning of the industry, really in its modern phase in the 80s and 90s. So we do a series of interviews with them. We have special interviews. So I interviewed a, um, a, a short-selling researcher last week. Uh, and we have extended exclusive podcasts. And we've also got a book club where we're looking at things like algorithmic trading and the impact on securities finance. So that's the pack. Uh, the pack is sponsoring this event today. So that's the unpaid uh, uh, advertising. And if I can get back to my screen, I will now ask you, I'll stop sharing. So listen, I uh, really appreciate uh, David. Thanks very much. Julian, thanks for joining us. John, always appreciate your comments. And all of you in the audience, really appreciate you joining us every week. Again, before you go, uh, please give us a like or equivalent on the platform. And I look forward to seeing you again next week. Thanks very much, everyone. And Thank you. Over and Thank you. All right.